Hello, everyone. This is Ricardo from Military History of Macau. Uh, this is the third video about the uh, military history of the Gi Hill in the 20th century. Um, very new. This is a construction from the 1950s, and, we're, uh, and in this video, we're going to go through uh, later on in the 20th century, in the mid 20th century, um, until 1975, when the uh, military garrison wasn't present uh, anymore. The Portuguese army uh, left uh, Macau uh, in, uh, definitely. I, uh, in, the, in the second uh, part of, in my last video, in the second part of the, about the, Gia, the military history of the Gia Hill, um, I finished, I was, and ended up in that video uh, around the time of the Second World War. Um, uh, Macau was a Portuguese territory, uh, and Portugal maintained neutrality throughout the whole um, Second World War. Um, even though, uh, for example, the Japanese did not respect the uh, Portuguese neutrality in, in Timor, uh, in Macau, officially, Macau was n never formally, officially occupied by the Japanese. However, of course, in Macau, they still wielded immense power and they could more definitely coerce the Portuguese administration into acting in its favor. Uh, um, throughout the uh, uh, Second, uh, Second World War, Macau was uh, actually never bombed. It never received any sort of uh, formal armed uh, attack from the Japanese. And actually, it was the U.S. Navy that, by an apparent um, mistake by the pilots and communication with um, officers who debriefed, the, the, um, they, they were, at that time in uh, January 1945, bombing, uh, conducting some bombing runs all over here in the south of China. And, for example, in Hong Kong, they were destroying all kinds of facilities that the Japanese could use, ports, airports, um, any kind of facilities that would be advantageous for the, m m the occupation of those territories. Um, they also ran bombing runs in what today is the Zhuhai Airport. It used to be in an airfield built by the Japanese, uh, very close nearby to Macau. And it was apparent mistake that the, the pilots on those uh, fighter uh, and uh, those uh, military aircraft did they were not debriefed that there was a neutral territory um, in, the, in the vicinity, so in the, in, the, in the area of South China. So they were not directly informed that Macau was a neutral territory in the area they were going to conducting, uh, they were going to conduct those bombing runs. So actually it was the, the Americans on, on the 16th of January 1945 and, and subsequently in the, during those years, that year of 1945, they conducted others. But m more damaging was what happened in the bombing runs on the Janu 16th of January 1945, where the hangar from the Naval Aviation Center was completely bombed in very here nearby the Gia Hill. Um, the San Francisco barracks with the headquarters were also bombed in the, um, they were shot by the machine guns of those um, aircraft, U.S. aircraft. And uh, also, it's apparent that they also conducted some um, uh, bombing runs, or at least some of the, they used some of the machine guns to, um, uh, to hit or to try and hit some of these areas in North Macau. And they also ended up destroying the radio tower that exists very close nearby in the Dona Maria. Um, uh, fortress, a little small fortress that exists just north of northeast of Macau, of the Gia Hill here in the, here in the Gia Hill. And so, but because the whole garrison here was underground, there wasn't any substantial damages. And also, from the at that time, some uh, some people were questioning why weren't the guns from the Gia Hill firing back. And, and it's obvious uh, why. These are very heavy, um, medium caliber naval artillery 
that are not designed to shoot against aircraft. But many civilians do not understand those intricacies of the of the military equipment that was that was uh, installed here. So some of the civilian population was wondering why the Portuguese weren't fighting back. And to be honest, the Portuguese at the beginning of the Second World War had some anti-air machine guns. However, with exactly with that pressure that the Japanese would wield as they as they as uh, as they did, they in one of the weapons they were also given to the Japanese in the, in a sense to just like I explained in my last video in the second part that a lot of military equipment was given to the Japanese in exchange for food. One of those also another equipment that was given to the Japanese were some anti-air uh, machine guns. So by the time that the, the Americans came and conducted that bombing run in January 1945, there was absolutely no weapons here in Macau that could even remotely uh, bring those aircraft down. Uh, moving on, the, uh, uh, with the Japanese surrender in August 1945, soon after the Chinese Civil War broke out again. Um, at, the, uh, at this time, the, uh, in, in the end of the 1945, the, the post-war period, 1945 to all to 1948, um, the garrison was in a state of disarray, of uh, huge disinvestment, uh, in a sense of manpower and equipment. The, while in Europe the perspective of a post-war period was one of peace, um, and also in the United States, in those territories, peace resumed after the, the hostilities ended from the Second World War. Here in China, unfortunately, there was a civil war that had to be contend with. Here in Macau, it was this fighting was still not nearby. However, throughout those years of 46, 47, 48, the Kuomintang, the, the nationalist uh, army, uh, was routed by the more moralized and, 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 and not so dispirited um, uh, forces from the, from the People's Liberation Army. And Portugal, that was very much anti-communist. And so with the progressive, with the um, huge advances that the People's Liberation Army was making southwards, and at the end, in, in, by the early 1949, it was obvious that the for the Portuguese that, and for most other um, onlookers outside, um, th they were looking at the civil war from the outside. It was very much uh, apparent that the nationalist army was going to definitely lose this civil war. Um, being a regime that was very much anti-communist, uh, this sounded the alarm in Portugal um, in, uh, in that early, late 1948, early 1949. And that's why in, in that year specifically, in 1949, the garrison um, grew to its largest um, size that it has ever been. Throughout all of these period of the 20th century, the garrison in Macau had around, um, it fluctuated between 600 and 1,200. It never went above 1,200 men. Um, de deployed here in Macau. But in, from 1949 to 1957, the garrison was reinforced and it had a total, it had an average every year of 3,000 uh, soldiers deployed here in Macau. So you can imagine going from a, a garrison of around 1,000 soldiers to triple that. Um, so these reinforcements uh, uh, stayed for quite a while. The, the, for, until 1957, the garrison um, remained in a sort of reinforced status, and that created the demand to bring more equipment. In this position, in this position right here, in, in where I'm sitting, uh, those guns, the three Schneider Kane um, uh, naval guns. 15 centimeter Schneider Kane and the two Armstrong uh, 12 centimeter 
uh, which should be the 4.7 uh, quick firing, uh, 4.7 inch quick firing guns from the British. Um, those remained from 1945 until 1951. Um, they remain as such, and given the how obs thoroughly obsolete they were, the, 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 the facilities here in the Gear Hill were very much underused or, in a sense, uh, burdened by useless um, equipment that could not be used, op it wasn't operational. That came to an end in 1951, and l let's understand why. In 1949 came a, those, part of those reinforcements from 1949 came first one battery of four howitzers, of the 25 pounder howitzers. So one battery, four guns, 1949. Um, and this was increased by a second battery, also of four guns of the 25 pounder howitzers um, that came to Macau. Uh, additionally, here in the Gear Hill was positioned one battery of uh, four uh, 7.5 centimeters Vickers AA guns. So uh, a model of guns that wasn't used by the British, but the British export, exported this model to several other countries. Portugal was one of them and adopted it in 1931. They were very much obsolete by now, these anti-air guns, but they were still brought to Macau. In a sense, they were um, causing a certain burden in Portugal, so it was deemed kind of useful to just send it to Macau. They kind of need it. They don't have anything else. <laughs> it's, it, it, they can they, they make some use of it. And so during these years, 1949, 1950, um, the howitzers and one battery of howitzers of four guns and the one battery of anti-air guns was positioned here um, close to these positions. They were not positioned here, but they were positioned nearby. The other, um, and let's remember this is a mobile, um, because one of the guns was stationary here and the other gun was in the San Francisco, in the headquarters um, position, or deployed over there and it could be moved at a moment's notice. That was the difference between these older guns that were here, that were fixed, and the new guns, the 25 pounder howitzers, were, uh, were mobile and could be deployed on a moment's notice um, to, uh, to a different location at a moment's notice. In 1951, finally, there was the, the work was done to disassemble this, these, uh, the guns, the position here, for example, in this position here was the Schneider Kane. The other, you know, the, so the three uh, guns and the two Armstrong guns were all disassembled, um, shipped back to Portugal. Um, I've lost track on if these guns were used for somewhere else, if they were disassembled and, the p and parts of the guns were used for other purposes, like a repurpose of the material, um, or, if, for example, if the steel was used, f if it was, um, whatever happened to these guns, including the two Armstrongs, I have not been able to track where th these guns ended up. They went back to Portugal to the uh, Brast Prata military factory, Fabrica Militar Brast Prata, so they were given to that entity, to the military factory, and there is, is nearby Lisbon, but I lost track of what happened to these guns afterwards. So when these guns were disassembled in 1951, in this position came the 25-pounder the, 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 the howitzers. They remain as such. However, this structure that we see here did not exist back then. And we're going to take a look, and, and then I'll explain what was done much, a little bit much later. In the post-war period, these facilities, the underground facilities here in the Gear Hill, remain uh, functional, operational, um, as intended in the 1950s. Uh, sorry, if, as intended in the 1920s. So we were already in the early 1950s, 
and these constructions, the underground facilities, um, originally from the 1920s, continue to serve, you could say, very well. The garrison and the officers from the 1950s had nothing but praises about the work and the usefulness of the works done here um, uh, somewhat almost 30 years earlier. Uh, I am moving to where we can see the difference. Well, at least the original uh, configuration of the uh, where you can, of the guns, of the gun emplacements. I hope you remember from the, my previous videos. And so it was around this area, more or less, this sort of flat, because all of this on top, all the way, the sun is shining a little bit. Okay, so we have the the behind so forget forget about this structure here forget about it you're gonna see so all of this area here we can see so with the the observation post here and it continued to be used well into the 1950s as these whole infrastructures were still uh, restricted military area uh, 25 pounder howitzers were positioned but uh, they were not positioned directly here on the older gun emplacements. Just like the uh, the 25 pounder howitzers and one battery, so four guns, and four guns, uh, another ba anti-air battery of the 7.5 centimeters, they were positioned around this area because as you can see, all of this area is very flat. There's a lot of flat area here and including a lot of behind this, this undergrowth and this shrubbery. Maybe I can position myself a little bit more. Now, all of this area here is sort of flat or flat-ish. All of this area around here. And so and th th this is the highest point. So uh, a few of the howitzers were positioned here. So two in this area and two howitzers on the old position where the two Armstrong guns used to be. And I'll be going there in, in, in a jiffy in a in very... Um, so all of this area, not on this side, but I'll show, I will show also through this area and how the surface. And this this was done in also in the 1920s. Uh, the Gia Hill wasn't at the top here. This area wasn't this flat. So one of, also one transformation that was done in this area is the flattening of all of this. Okay, let me. It's always tricky. Okay. So as you can see, all of this area here is quite. It is quite flat, all of this. And this was the position where also the anti-air guns were, were placed and could serve. There is a, a, a picture, I will show the picture of, but I'm not sure if these are, def, are definitely guns. I have uh, information that this, these guns were, were the, the, the photo was taken in Macau, but I'm not, 100% sure if these are correct. But given the, 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 the description of the anti-air guns, that they were surrounded by um, sandbags and they were a camouflage in some ways, it could point to this being a photograph of this area where the, where the, because back then the Gia Hill wasn't so, there wasn't so much foliage as there is today. It was relatively, um, not a lot of uh, uh, foliage existed on top of the hill back then. Um, the, of course, this uh, is now not maintained in, in, with the same purpose as the military um, used to do it. I mean, the, the, the military would clear this area so they would have a clear, clear horizontal um, firing angle. And so you might be wondering, I'll move on, Jen, to just this little structure here that was built. Um, you recall that the tunnels will come uh, come down here, and from the, also from the old photo of the 1930s, where you can see the three Schneider Canet pieces, the, the, this structure doesn't exist. This was an improvement made in 1954 to give more room to the rangefinder. So there was a rangefinder here in this observation post, but is but is heavily reinforced and with very, very thick walls. And so it was difficult to have a very good 
it had to be a sort of smaller range finder that couldn't have as much uh, potential as the one that was positioned here. So a bigger range finder was positioned here and this small structure was created. Now you may ask, what is a range finder? Well, it is a device that is used by the military, in this case by artillery, to acquire the position of your target. So, let me just... So you point the range finder in the direction of your target and we will give you the, the estimate, the distance f from your position to the target. And so allows then for the artillerymen to calculate the, the angle, precision, etc. and where ex more or less uh, you could say the, where your target is. And this simple structure was created. It used to have like a roof made of like some very uh, thin metal metal sheets to protect it from the elements from rain and uh, typhoons for example Macau is a, has a lot of typhoons and so this sort of roomier structure was built to put a better range finder and with the 1926 observation post very nearby uh, this what we can see today, the gun emplacements, the original gun emplacements that some of them have been um, rebuilt as uh, we uh, as I've shown in the, in the, in the previous video, um, previously in this video. And this is from the 1950s. The way we see the gun emplacement today, this kind of overhead protection, the protection for the underground tunnels, this sort of um, raised uh, concrete that we can see surrounding the, 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 the gun emplacement is actually from the 1950s. And this was a project that was asked by the military commander at the time, and who, uh, Rupreira da Cunha, and who actually then fulfilled in the, the duty, the mission of uh, building this uh, fortifications how they are, is at that time a young lieutenant's engineering, Lieutenant Muraj Bohok, we can see in the, in the photo, that's him, that's him uh, on, the, on the picture, alongside my grandfather, uh, which he was, at that time of these uh, gun facilities, these gun emplacements were built in the 1950s, uh, my father was the uh, uh, military, uh, uh, was the commander of the military engineering company um, he, he, here in here in Macau, um, but Muraj Bohok was he, uh, the mission was given to him, um, and he explained. I had an interview with him that his or original plan was to have a uh, several. They have three uh, supports for this this overhead protection. That was the whole idea. Um, original idea, what he was thinking. So he consulted with the artillery officers and remember that the, how the uh, gun emplacements used to look like throughout the whole 20th century is they had a 360 horizontal range of fire so they could fire all around. However, he was being asked to give this overhead protection but he needed some place to put the pillars. So the officers is, we know we need the 360 degrees. We we can, um, and so uh, he said that or his original um, uh, idea was to have three pillars, but backwards and forwards with the artillery officers, and this was the solution found for for the gun emplacements, and and at that time this is in the 1950s, so we're uh, not talking about anymore about those. Uh, uh, older uh, naval artillery pieces because uh, those artillery pieces by <laughs> if Pintulelu in the 19 in 1930 already called this these um, <laughs> these art the artillery pieces that were here in Macau as a museum of antiquities we can let alone imagine how old these guns were in the 1940s so by the, by the late 1940s, they were very much inoperational. 
um, anymore as a lot of components were not, uh, the Portuguese army wasn't able to purchase from the original uh, factory in, uh, uh, around that time, 1949, 1950, the, the guns that were here were removed, were disassembled and shipped back to Portugal. And on its, in, 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 in its place, in these specific spots, was where the 25-pounder howitzers were, were placed. And so uh, a howitzer is a wheel, it's not a fixed, it doesn't have a fixed mounting, like a naval mounting like these older guns had. Um, but as Engineer Muraj Bohok in an interview, he, he said that there was no, nothing was done here to the uh, bottom part of the gun emplacement. So this is original from the 1920s. Uh, but everything around is, is new. And for example, one accommodation that had to be made was a ramp so that the, the, the howitzers could be wheeled in and wheeled out. After all, one of the ideas to bring the howitzers is that they could be uh, mobile. The idea was not to have fixed artillery. Uh, it was more to have mobile artillery so they could be uh, placed in other in, 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 at a moment's notice, the unit can be uh, moved to a different location. Um, however, after 19, uh, 1951, actually four howitzers were permanently based here. Uh, so we have an example here of one of the uh, gun emplacements that was revamped in the 1950s. Comparing with the other original that still looks original, for example, there is this cover piece over the entrance of the tunnels that goes in over here, which is very different from uh, what we see in the uh, original open air gun emplacements from from the ones that is the, the original one that's still um, situated a little bit uphill. Uh, the mountings are still the same since the 1926, uh, since the late 1920s. It still is the mountings for the Schneider Kane uh, 15 centimeter naval gun from the from the um, from the Portuguese cruiser. It, it has this uh, raised the 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 ground around the gun emplacement has been raised, and this thick layer of concrete has been put over it to deflect shrapnel. This, the idea here is any inbounding uh, uh, artillery shell will hit and then the shrapnel will deflect away from the gun. Uh, that's, the, the, that's why it has this shape. And we have the cover that has been referenced by engineer Muraj Bohok. Uh, when I hid it in the interview, he is the engineer in charge of it. So we can see then this cover protecting the entrance of the underground tunnels. So they remain as uh, the same since, uh, for example, the stairs. The stairs that we can see is still from 1926, but everything then around this, these walls here on both sides, the cover over it uh, into the inside. Now that's 1950s, like, like this structure here for to deflecting. Um, as well, the, the ramp was also created. Again, let's remember that the guns that were going to be positioned here are mobile. This is the, while the original 1920, uh, 1920s gun emplacement was for a fixed, fixed gun, so a gun that could not mo be moved, the, this sort of gun emplacement is designed for a mobile piece of artillery, in this case the 25-pounder howitzer. So uh, the experiments uh, engineer Mraj Bohok gave the, uh, uh, during the interview, he said that there were experiments made how, in a way how to do it, and this was the solution found, just to have a ramp to allow for the gun to come in and out as, uh, as needed. Very interestingly, one of the uh, next to one of the entrances is a seven-a-side 
uh, football uh, pitch. It has been like this since at least the early 1950s. Since we can see in, in the original sketch from the late 1950s of the uh, 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 the sketch from the tunnels of the 1950s, a little mention of a Camp de Bolinha, so a seven-a-side football pitch. And so, very interestingly, this football pitch has there has been a football pitch here since the 1950s, or probably much earlier than that. Uh, obviously, before it was only for recreational purposes for the units. So the units that were positioned here, they would have this seven-a-side uh, pitch for them, for them to play some football in their spare times and to keep themselves entertained. And today is now part of, it is now part of the public recreation, is a public recreational facility. So, yes. Oh. Oh. So in total, there were of the original five um, gun platforms that existed from the 1920s, that is three from the 15 centimeter uh, Schneider Cane battery and the two gun platforms a bit further north, um, there were from the 12, centi 12 centimeter Armstrong guns. Uh, of those five gun platforms, four were transformed into what we see today. There's one that just goes uh, just behind me, this little track that goes into the fifth uh, gun platform and the and, uh, one that is still um, original. I've already shown in the, in the video before, it's the original is going through that track. And so of those four uh, revamped uh, gun platforms, they receive um, code names. For example, this one is Alda, then we have a bit closer to here, in, still in the, in the uh, underground tunnels of the 15 centimeter battery, former 15 centimeter battery. Um, so Alda, this one, Berta, and then further north on the 12 centimeter battery, we had Carmen and Dora. So these were the code names of A, B, C, D. So the code names for these um, gun platforms. Uh, th because this was a um, permanent fortification that was rebuilt in some, in some sense, it was given an honorary name, just like in the early in the 20th century when they were built a, uh, these gun platforms here in the Gear Hill, they were given honorary names. Here in uh, these revamped um, facilities were also given an honorary name. It was given, the, in, this, so in this whole revamped battery, it was given the honorary name of Bateria Costa uh, Ferreira, which is in honor of an artillery officer, um, Eduardo da Costa Ferreira, which um, showed great bravery in the Lali uh, battle in 9th of April 1918, so in the Great War, a Great War veteran, and also a very uh, important figure that in the revolution led to the affirmation of the Estado Novo um, dictatorship period. Um, uh, in the first half of the 20th century, the soldiers that were here in the Gear Hill, deployed in the artillery units that stay here, here in, in the Gear Hill, were exclusively uh, composed of Portuguese personnel coming from, from Portugal, uh, mainland Portugal, Azores, and Madeira, so called the Metropolitanos, so from the metropolis, the Portuguese from the metropolis. And this was very much the case. Um, for half a century until uh, 1949, when for the first time in, in from 1949 uh, onwards until the troops, artillery troops left Gia uh, in in, uh, in 1963, roughly in late 1963, the troops that were here were uh, African soldiers. From 1941 to 1951 was from Angola. The um, artillery battery with the with 25 pound howitzers were uh, soldiers from Angola, uh, over, over with um, Portuguese officers from um, so wh white Portuguese officers and also white Portuguese 
sergeants, but the large uh, majority of men, of soldiers, corporals and, and, and privates were from, uh, were from Africa. And then onwards from 1951 until, the, until September of 1962 were soldiers from uh, Mozambique. Uh, they created, this was a very well established tradition and there were a lot of officers in Mozambique that were very well versed in the traditions of the African troops that uh, the, in, in the recruitment of African troops uh, uh, and, and they knew very well the intricacies of the several ethnicities because um, those recruit, recruiting officers, in, 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 in case in Mozambique, which is a very well established tradition and in, in established, the officers were, would always try to compose a, in this case, for example, the artillery units that would stay here would always be composed of just one ethnicity. Um, the Portuguese would always try to not have um, one, for example, one infantry unit or one uh, artillery unit with different ethnicities. They would always try to have one uh, unit composed solely on uh, Makuas, for example, Makondes, so in not mixing ethnicities within, uh, within a company, within a unit or a battalion, for example. It was, it was harder to do, so at least within a company-sized unit, to keep, uh, to have just one ethnicity to promote cooperation and solidarity, camaraderie, you could say, among the soldiers here. And so, until September of 1962, the Portuguese, um, actually most of the Portuguese garrison here, half of the Portuguese garrison uh, was um, composed of, of African soldiers. And with the problems arising uh, with, obviously, the problems for the Portuguese government, in this case for the, for the dominion or for the, uh, the uh, it's, it's called, you know, it's an empire in the over overseas provinces, was that in the 1950s there were nationalistic um, uh, aspirations uh, clearly visible and that transformed into several um, throughout those per that period, 1950s, 1960s, of several uh, countries in Africa achieving independence from, its, from their former colonizers. Um, Portugal was a country that resisted, the, the government at the time, the, the dictatorship resisted um, letting go of, the, of those provinces. And when Angola in 1961, uh, when, the, when those um, uh, in independence aspirations of, uh, started really to materialize in Angola in 1961, and they were already somewhat visible already by that time, also in Mozambique, Mozambique forced the Portuguese government and the garrison here in Macau to um, send those soldiers, for example, the African soldiers from Mozambique that would be stationed here in the, in the barracks, here in the Gear Hill, would um, sometimes in conversations they would say uh, things that really denoted that they were actually very well informed privates, that they knew what was going, what was happening in, in, in to some degree or of those uh, nationalistic aspirations of the African, African people and to achieve independence. So the garrison uh, did not, uh, so the African soldiers did leave in September of 1962 and they were replaced by a very re much reduced, uh, here in the Gear Hill, they were redu a very sm much smaller artillery unit, a batteria de artilleria reduzida, so there were still some soldiers, for example one of the uh, p uh, observation posts that I've shown before was still manned by an, until until um, early 1964. It is true that the tunnels that are just right next to me, the entrances to the tunnels and the barracks would be here in this area, in this flat area in front of me. They were not, uh, nobody was, was already here. These artillery soldiers were spread through other units. However, they still maintained some 
degree, uh, they were um, still deployed in Macau in a way so they could still conduct salvos. Um, they still manned a, uh, an observation post. Through this area until 1975 continued to be restricted military area. So the, the tunnels that were built in the 1920s were, there wasn't an artillery unit big enough to man these the, the whole, whole facilities. Um, however, in the 1950s, these facilities, these underground facilities, besides being uh, artillery installation, they still had one, um, one other purpose which was to be where the garrison would have its last stand. In a sense, we could call it Macau's Alamo. So that's a reference where a garrison makes its last stand, where it has nowhere else to go, is backed into a corner, and that's where it's going to make, militarily speaking, it's going to have its last stand. Um, this is obviously theoretical, However, it, it, it had that purpose, not just being the artillery installations for those, uh, for those artillery pieces, but were also uh, a sort of Macau's Alamo. And when the units left in so uh, early 1964, when that smaller artillery unit composed of um, soldiers from Portugal um, left, and there were no more artillery units here in Macau, or even uh, no more than uh, half a platoon of soldiers available to conduct those salvos. Um, despite that, these facilities maintained, at least theoretical of course, these facilities maintained that characteristic of being a Alamo, a Macau's Alamo where the garrison would still make its last stand. And until um, 19, early 1970s, uh, it retained that, that characteristic. The garrison left um, definitely in, in, in late 1975. Most units left by August 1975 and the command just uh, was uh, remain here in 1975 to wrap things up. Thank you all for watching the what was the third video about the Gear Hill, military history of the Gear Hill in the 20th century. I hope you had uh, fun watching it. You learned a bit more about Macau's military history and more specifically here in the Gear Hill. I hope there's other, uh, the link down below in the bio, there is uh, the links for the first part and the second part in case you're interested, uh, where I speak a bit more earlier in the 20th century and the construction of all of these facilities where, for example, these stairs where I'm sitting on, uh, where I talk about the construction of these facilities early in the 20th century. So thank you so much for watching and I hope you see you next time.